Hans Hermann Hoppe, it's of course a pleasure to have you here. Thank you so much for coming. You're opening a lecture this, at the Mises University. Um, was intriguing because you went through some personal biography that I don't think is well known. It seems as if you're, um, you began on the left, really not just as a graduate student, but even into your full-time professional career. Is that right? Into the first semesters of my studies, I um, was a leftist during the last few years in in high school. Um, that can be explained partly due to the fact that that was also the time of of the student student rebellion. It was also a way to free yourself of the discipline of your parents, I guess. So I was an, an ardent reader of Marx, um, and then it took and the selection of my university teachers had obviously also something to do with the fact that I was a lefty. So I went to the University of Frankfurt, which was um, the center of left-wing thought at the time, and uh, selected uh, Jürgen Habermas as my principal teacher and was extremely proud that he accepted me. I think I was in my fourth semester to become his doctoral, st doctoral student. Um, but then I um, gradually moved to uh, more free market uh, positions. I did realize that there was something fundamentally wrong with Marxism. I en encountered Böhm Bawerk's criticism and that by and large convinced me um, that that was the wrong thing. But I did co discovered Mises only much late, much later, actually by some funny accident because um, my parents had both been refugees from East Germany. My uh, mother's family had been expropriated by the Russians in 1946. Initially, she lived in an area in East Germany that had been occupied by the Americans. And uh, then the Americans exchanged that province for what became West Berlin and moved out of that territory. And then the Russians moved in. And the Russians expropriated all major landowners, and my mother's family were major landowners. Uh, but most of my relatives uh, lived in East Germany, and we regularly visited them. And um, you always had to pay an entrance fee to enter the paradise of workers and farmers. And, and since we stayed at uh, my um, at relatives' houses, um, in order to, you had to somehow spend the money that you were forced to exchange. And there were only two ways to do that. Uh, one was to buy Russian records of Russian composers. And uh, the other possibility was to buy uh, collected works of Lenin, collected works of Stalin, collected works of Walter, Ulf, Walter Ulbricht, who was the prime minister of East Germany, and uh, Erich Honecker was his successor. And uh, one of my book purchases was uh, a uh, text that they used to train uh, students in political economy, um, and in this in this book, uh, they mentioned all the major enemies, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, they mentioned, for instance, not only Bern Bavrik, with whom I had been familiar before, but also uh, as the most evil of all. Ludwig von Mises. Um, <laughs> at that time, I did not immediately start reading Ludwig von Mises, but uh, at least I encountered I encountered his name, and I knew that he was a guy that might be uh, eventually worthwhile uh, 
taking a look at. Uh, at the same time, in West Germany, you did not have these names of Hayek and Mises mentioned in any of the economic textbooks. I think the, f the first economic textbooks I read in West Germany was the German translation of Paul Samuelson's mm -hmm. uh, book. Um, And uh, there was no mention of them, at least not in the editions that were available at that time. Um, but there were, uh, there was mention of the fact that the East Bloc would eventually take over uh, the West. It was just a matter of a matter of time. Uh, and uh, because I could see what was going in East Germany at at the time it was enorm enormous scarcity of things you sometimes you could not get milk and the other day you could not get um, sausages and on the third day you could not get beer uh, I saw th these types of uh, descriptions the East would take over the West um, were entirely uh, entirely ridiculous. Well, now how does it happen that there could have been a socialist in West Germany at all at the time? I mean, given the, the clear contrast, we had a one system of socialism right on the other side of the wall and one that's predominantly capitalistic on the other side of the wall. How could anybody, uh, somebody as brilliant as Habermas, have favored a socialist system under yeah. those conditions? Uh, because the social... Uh, socialist and social democratic parties in West Germany quickly reformed themselves due to the fact that they were uh, placed in a country right next to the communist type. So the German social democrats were the first ones who became moderate social democrats as compared with those that wanted to have uh, mass scale uh, nationalization of, of industry industries uh, and in countries that were further removed from the Iron Curtain this transformation of the social uh, socialist and social democratic parties took much longer uh, so it it did affect what the social democrats were all about uh, that the millions of people in the West of course had seen with their own eyes what was going on uh, in in the East I remember after integration occurred, you wrote an essay that uh, still strikes me as absolutely uh, brilliant um, in retrospect. There were aspects of, of integration of Germany that you regretted at the time. Do you, and do you want to explain what those were and, and, uh, and maybe um, uh, address the question whether you were right? Of, of course, I think I was right. The alternatives at that time were uh, either East Germany becomes part of West Germany, yeah. so to speak, and then you could immediately predict what would happen, that the welfare state would be expanded uh, to the East at massive, uh, at massive costs involved, and at the same time West Germany would become more socialistic because of the integration of these people who had lived under communism and had to a certain extent acquired the communist type of uh, mentality. And the other alternative would have been, of course, that East Germany becomes an independent state uh, trying to stand on their own feet, which would have forced them uh, to introduce far more radical free market reforms mm -hmm. Then it became necessary due to the fact that they became uh, subsidized up to this day uh, by by West Germany. Yeah, so we call it, we call it a, 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 it was a step towards freedom, but but it was also a lost opportunity. In it was way. a great lost opportunity. In, in actually, some other countries that could not rely on some sponsor like West Germany bailing them out and subsidizing them did more drastic reforms. For instance, the Czech Republic uh, did better in this regard than. Uh, than they did in East Germany because there were simply no um, uh, no people in in the West in these massive uh, massive numbers uh, who could be forced to sub to subsidize uh, subsidize. You once wrote an essay. I remember quoting uh, the words of Goethe uh, praising the the old German city states 
and their liberality and and the way that led to a world of, of free trade and free migration yeah. and a, a, a good disposition in the uh, early 19th century was so to speak a minority position um, most germans craved to have a unified states because they looked at France and other centralized uh, countries and wanted to have that and Goethe's position was um, in order to have a unification all you need is the same currency, the same measures, the same language but it would be good uh, to have competition between small uh, entities and he compared Germany favorably to France which had been a centralized state and said uh, look if you look at France everything is concentrated in Paris and if you go outside of Paris it is deep and dark province uh, and in contrast you had 37 or 39 principalities in Germany, each competing against each other, each wanting to have the best university, each wanted to have wanting to have the, the best painting galleries, the best theaters, the best uh, orchestras and and so forth. And uh, that was a phase that made Germany great. Um, and um, in the way the decline of Germany began with the unification of Germany uh, after the uh, Franco-Prussian War in 1870-71, uh, um, and the unification was also achieved through uh, means of war. Um, not all that different to what you see in the United States happening almost at, at the same time, just a little bit before. So Bismarck played a similar role to Lincoln uh, in the United States by uniting uh, Germany by means, by means of war. Uh, Germany's outstanding position in terms of sciences and culture continued of course for a while afterwards because um, the old tradition stayed on f for a while uh, the all these various uni universities uh, still continue to exist but the University of Berlin became indeed then the leading university uh, in Germany whereas before it was just one of the universities is uh, next to next to many others. One of the most counterintuitive um, arguments you make, I believe, it's in democracy, and it's it's the one I, I I keep returning to because it's it's so alarming and so shocking, is um, how you uh, have related the prosperity of a nation to its propensity towards I imperial conquests. It, uh, so that the more capitalistic a nation is, the more wealthy it is, but then also the wealthier, wealthier and more expansionary its government uh, tends to be. Um, I mean, there's actually a very simple, a simple explanation. If you are a state at all, then you can externalize the cost of aggression onto others, so all states in a way tend to be aggressive. Um, but since aggression always involves costs as well, you have to finance the tanks, you have to finance the soldiers and so forth, uh, it tends to be the case that those states that are more liberal internally um, have uh, a more prosperous population at their disposal, so to speak, uh, and uh, other things being roughly the same, the size of the country, the size of the population being roughly the same. Um, this allows you then to be more aggressive because you know you will tend to win out uh, in wars, except in wars that are 
Blitzkriege, uh, where you immediately succeed in taking over another place. But if a war is drawn out for a little bit, uh, then of course the prosperity of a country matters whether you will win or not. Um, and I have also used this to explain the, the paradox that why is it that the United States tends to conduct a more aggressive foreign policy, for instance, in the Soviet Union, which internally was uh, an uh, utmost evil an empire, um, but of course an empire not run by complete morons who did not know anything about economics whatsoever. They did know, of course, that in a long drawn out war, they would tend to lose out against a comparatively large country such as the United States. And because of that, uh, cared more about internal affairs, keeping those things that they already controlled uh, under control whereas a country like the United States uh, knows we will of course win all wars accordingly we can afford to be more aggressive in our foreign policy how much is this is this influenced by culture and the nature of a society I mean for example in the United States you have a kind of expansionary impulse at, at the root of our, our history whereas a, a country like Switzerland which is a, is a very wealthy uh, you see no kind of as far as I know no kind of expansionary impulse within that po population I, I think very early in the Swiss history uh, Switzerland also uh, pursued aggressive policies um, and they were beaten back in this by countries that were significantly larger than they themselves were uh, and then decided so to speak uh, now we stay within the borders that currently exist uh, and uh, uh, follow a policy of neutrality but, but in the Swiss history uh, there does exist at the, in the early phases some uh, imperialist uh, imp uh, impulse uh, as well. You know, another thing that you've said, I, of course, I mean, um, I, I could uh, speak all day about all the counterintuitive and conclusions that you've demonstrated in the course of your writings, but one of them um, concerns um, your demonstration, I remember one time, about uh, that the U.S. Constitution really represented a, a, an expansion of the state, not uh, really an attempt to, to rein it in or... or curb it. Would you say this is a general uh, principle that anytime you, you find a new constitution being asserted by a state that it's most likely uh, there's an ulterior motive to, to, to expand it beyond its, its current? It is always an attempt to, to centralize um, because the confederation that existed uh, before was obviously less centralized and uh, uh, the Constitution was precisely the attempt to overcome the limitations of uh, of a federation and create a central state, uh, initially a very weak central state, but one that predict predictably uh, became ever more centralized. You do you do find the same thing also in uh, in Switzerland. I mean, even though they abstained, of course, from aggressive foreign policies, largely due to the fact that they were surrounded by far larger countries than they themselves are. Um, initially, almost all powers was uh, rested with the, with the cantons, which are, so to speak, the equivalents of uh, the American states. Um, but this has also been in the course of time been gradually eroded and the central government in Switzerland has also acquired more and more power. So the process is the same. Uh, it has proceeded in a uh, in a somewhat uh, somewhat smaller pace than it did in in the United States. Even nowadays, the cantons are f uh, far more powerful than the American. Uh, American states are, and uh, in the Swiss case, the the cantons are also still very homogeneous. Um, in a country like Switzerland, where you have uh, 
uh, German-speaking people, we have French-speaking people, we have Italian-speaking people, and then a small group of, uh, they speak uh, Reto-Romanic language, a very small place. Um, the cantons are almost uh, completely homogeneous. Um, otherwise, it would have been difficult for Switzerland to stay as stable and as harmonious as it is um, because one nationality would have tried to dominate uh, the others. Uh, there is still uh, quite a distinct difference between the German-speaking parts of Switzerland and the French-speaking parts of Switzerland. The German-speaking parts are um, more free market oriented, uh, less socialistic uh, in their general outlook. Uh, the French cantons are more more so, um, and the, even if they have uh, plebiscites, uh, countrywide plebiscites, you can you can see that um, the French speaking parts. Uh, are more favorable disposed to becoming part of the European Union, mm -hmm. whereas the German-speaking parts are vigorously opposed opposed to it. So even though people mention Switzerland frequently as a multicultural society, Switzerland is not in the sense a multicultural society because the cantons, which are still quite influential, the, ca the cantons are homogeneous. You mentioned the European Union. You could cite that as a great example of how a constitution leads to an expansion of, 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 of the state. And yet the history... Um, of wanting to unite uh, Europe it was a, it was a liberal dream. It was a desire to increase liberty. The in, the initial idea was, of course, to erect a free trade a free trade zone. But a, a free trade zone uh, only requires two sentences: whatever you want to ship out, you ship out; whatever you want to import, uh, you can import. Um, but th that has uh, uh, almost from the very beginning of the European Union uh, been forgotten and instead the attempt has been to harmonize the tax and regulation structure in all of Europe. That has not been accomplished completely. Um, there still exists no free trade in in Europe. Uh, if you watch German TV, for instance, they have constantly reports that the German border control has again arrested a few people who were smuggling cigarettes that are taxed less in Poland to to Germany, um, despite. Uh, the uh, ultimate goal, we want to have free trade. There is uh, a skiing region in Austria that borders onto Italy, and uh, you can ski down one side of the hill, you are in uh, Italy, and you, you ski down the other side of the hill, then you are in Austria. And even in that ski resort, uh, they had also the Austrian TV reported with great pride about uh, great accomplishments of the Austrian border controls having arrested again a few people who had bought a few liters alcohol too much in <laughs> Italy and smuggled it over to Austria and vice, vice versa. So the whole thing has very little to do with, uh, with free trade. And as far as the euro was concerned, it had always been uh, my my conviction, I have also written on this, that the purpose of that was uh, to weaken in particular the German mark um, because the euro would be, of course, more inflationary than the German uh, German mark had been. The German mark had always been uh, some sort of obstacle for other countries to inflate as much as they really desire to inflate. Um, that had nothing to do with uh, specific German virtues, but it has something to do with the fact that Germany had experienced the hyperinflation uh, twice, and the German public was a little bit more sensitive towards inflation. So the German Bundesbank uh, 
was a little bit more reluctant to follow the general inflationary trend that all central bank banks naturally. How, how fragile do you think the EU is today? Do you think it could uh, blow up and revert back to its old nationalist uh, schemes? I, I, ho I hope it would happen, but uh, and I'm always amazed um, with how much the Germans are putting up because the Germans are the main financiers of um, of the uh, southern European countries. Um, so if the 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 cycle, the cycle is so to speak. Uh, that the the crisis broke out in the perif in the periphery, um, and and the Germans have to pay the bills for it. When we had the conference two years ago in Salamanca, mm. and we were driving from Madrid to Salamanca on beautiful new expressways with very little yeah. traffic, <laughs> I remember then uh, Hazel Suarte de Soto told me. <laughs> Look, you guys have financed all of this for us. If you uh, drive on German expressways, uh, they are somewhat uh, in, 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 in far less good shape than the Spanish expressways <laughs> expressways are. And, and the Germans so far don't seem to rebel against it. But the debt, the sovereign debt crisis, could make the difference. Could, it could make yeah, the difference. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yes, Greece is in worse shape, Spain is in worse shape, Italy is in worse shape than Germany, but Germany is also in pretty bad shape uh, and will get increasingly in worse shape given the fact that they have to bail out these other places. Eventually, there might be a rebellion of, of the German public uh, against this, but the Germans, of course, suffer from this uh, problem that they have a special history and mm. feel eternally guilty um, and are not allowed to uh, rebel. Yeah. We mentioned uh, some of your books, um, maybe in the order in which they've appeared, appeared in English. You have a book on methodology, um, uh, methodology, uh, the uh, the method of the Austrian School of Economics, and then you had uh, theory of socialism and capitalism, which is still being used as probably the leading comparative economic systems text within the Austrian world. And then after that, democracy, the god that failed, it was probably your most popular book. And then economics and ethics of private private property, which is your most theoretical um, treatise. Um, am I leaving anything out in English? Yeah, then I've edited the, the, the myth of national, national, defense. national defense. And then you've had a Feshriff in your honor, which is a wonderful book put together by Stefan Kinsella. Yeah, and, uh, I'm very uh, happy. Yeah, very that's, happy. A, that's a fun, a really fun book. Now, how many languages has your writings, has your writings been translated into? I, I think that uh, t 25 plus languages. What, is your, what, do you, what would you say is your most widely distributed book, most widely read book? I, I think the Democracy, the Democracy is a God That Failed is the most widely distributed book. But in recent years, uh, the theory of socialism and capitalism has been uh, has written several translations. Um, I think a Romanian translation came out. Um, uh, Mises Brazil has uh, published... Uh, that book also in Portuguese translation. They also published the um, uh, economic science and the Austrian. That's a mess of the book, yeah. Um, Which was actually, in fact, a transcription of a series of speeches. Right. Yeah. Right. I think it one was, article was added to it, but yeah. it was uh, it was my first lecture that I gave in the United States, the first uh, Mises University that we held at uh, at Stanford. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and um, your your book, um, uh, Democracy, was published by uh, Transaction, but we've published your Economics and Ethics book. Um, but and I, I and I, I regret in a way that the book was published by a trans by, no. by a, a commercial publisher. You have no control over it. They have even prevented some translations of the book to come out because it it charged uh, too high prices. 
I mean, the book has been translated into six or seven languages also, but um, I get constantly complaints. I cannot download it. and Yeah, it's not available free online. It is, uh, but at the time, the possibilities that exist nowadays simply did not uh, exist. I mean, many of these things have just changed in in recent uh, in, in recent years yeah it's easy to look back and say oh well that was a mistake we should have done yeah. it ourselves but yeah no it yeah, was we knew it, that i mean looking back i would say that it was a big mistake that i had done it at the time i was happy that uh, a reputable publisher like trans it meant a lot at the time you know, i should say about your theory of socialism and capitalism it's not just a comparative economics text you have in there the essence of your property rights theory which um, which I, I don't think we need to say anything more about this, but I would just encourage everybody to go and read that and understand very uh, with great precision what you're saying, because you, whatever you say, you say it very carefully. And uh, to my mind, you uh, really uh, might be the first uh, thinker, uh, which is a remarkable thing to say, who laid out a, such a coherent view of what constitutes property that it makes it... Uh, makes it possible to so clearly delineate what what is and and what isn't and no property rights theory before yours really was as thorough and it has a special application to the area of intellectual property so i mean uh the worldview of hans hermann hoppe has a, a profound um explanatory power in the world of digital media for example yeah the the, the book has also a german predecessor um uh, part part of the previous German book was called Eigentum, Anarchie und Staat. I incorporated into that, but I have also certain things in that German book that uh, I think are even better than uh, than in that uh, uh, theory of socialism and and capitalism. Uh, sometimes you look back at your own things, you are just amazed th that you did good things also when you were young. Yeah. Well, I've read the book probably three or four times, and, and uh, the first time you read it, you think, well, he's, he points out that socialism is impoverishing, whereas capitalism is good. You do a lot more than that. There's a lot of theory in that book, and you have to really read it several times to, in order to fully appreciate just what a substantive contribution that book really is. Um, Hans Hoppe, thank you for sitting down with me for a few minutes. There's so much we could talk about, and I hope there's uh, time in the future. Before we close here, though, uh, maybe you should say something about your own society. Yeah, I, fo I found it that society is some sort of counterpart to uh, the Mont Pelerin uh, society, uh, which refused to have me as a member for reasons that I do not want to dwell upon um, and uh, the society is um, by invitation by invitation only I want to have it small uh, I want to have it intimate I run it like a salon um, and uh, want to assemble hardcore libertarians Rosbardians um, it is controlled by those people. It's controlled completely by myself <laughs> with some good advisors that I have in the, in the background. Um, but it also wants to uh, have yeah, sympathizing conservatives, uh, politically incorrect uh, conservatives um, who are also personally nice uh, individuals so that it is like a, a gathering of friends many of them come regularly every year and there is always a small number of additional people rotating rotating people um, and um, our purpose is to yeah, to have intellectual entertainment, uh, stimulating entertainment, uh, to not be afraid to talk about any type of subjects, even about subjects that sometimes would not be talked about at Mises Institute functions or at any other functions. 
Um, you know, people come back from your conference and they always tell me, they say, you know, Hans Hoppe is just the most fun guy ever. He's just a blast to be with, which is a funny thing to say. I think I think it I think it is not it's not just me. I don't think I'm such a blasted fun person, but I uh, given that I'm more of a dry northern German, um I love to have people surround me that draw the best out of me and uh, and contribute to the whole event being a big blast. Well, I think you're a blast, and I've enjoyed visiting with you today. Thank you so much, Dr. Thank you so much.